Good afternoon, Web Summit. Uh, lovely to be with you again, and I'm delighted to be joined by Libby Liu, who is the CEO of Whistleblower Aid. Now, I'm sure some people in the audience will be familiar with Whistleblower Aid, but some people might not have heard of you yet. So, sort of, how long have you been around, and what's the sort of short version of what you guys do? Uh, so, Whistleblower Aid has been around six years. And we are a nonprofit that provides holistic support for public interest whistleblowers. So people that are driven by their conscience to come forward to try to make things better for everybody. So when we sort of think of whistleblowers, we often think of people like Daniel Ellsberg or Chelsea Manning or Edward Snowden, all of whom faced fairly heavy costs for their actions. Is I mean, part of your mission is to try and eliminate those costs, isn't it? Sort of, how do you go about doing that? So, we're fortunate in that we are operating in the United States, where there are laws that protect whistleblowers, specifically for various uh, regulatory agencies and um, issues that we really, really need uh, people to sh help the transparency of. You know, the issue is the asymmetric power between the people who have secrets and the people that are forced to keep those secrets um, from us. And we believe that transparency and accountability are the only way to have a resilient democratic society. So when, when people come to journalistic outlets, they tend to feel like they've frustrated the, the avenues available to them. But what tends to happen is, based on the official procedures they happen so is it essentially that you're helping them guide through that labyrinth that's exactly correct so there is a way that whistleblowers can come forward they can inform the public regulators policymakers but they have to do it in a specific way so that they're not sued and they don't go to prison right so our job is to help whistleblowers navigate how to do this in a way that doesn't leave them open to ruin their lives and their career. It's now, sad. Uh, yeah. Now, I know quite a few sort of old school, hardcore investigative journalists who are a bit uncomfortable with the idea of your organization because it's almost as if you are a competitor to journalists in the newsrooms. You know, don't go to them, go, come to us instead. Is that how you see what you do? No, not at all. I, I've spent my career um, helping press freedom and you know the freedom of information because I believe in informed decision making. So when we look at it, it's, um, we think that journalists do want their sources to be protected. Nobody wants to get a source burned. And um, if we can help the journalist with the parameters of how to keep their sources safe, um, that's very positive. Now, um, many investigative journalists are referring people to us, you know, because whistleblowers, they see it in the press, they think the best way to do this is go to a journalist. If you do that, you could be violating NDA, a confidentiality agreement, breaking laws, you don't know. So, um, in the recent year, we've gotten referrals from journalists that have had very, very good whistleblowers come to them, and they're like, look, why don't you talk to Whistleblower Aid so that when this comes out, you're going to be protected instead of targeted? Now, I don't, I don't know if you're able or willing to speak about this, and if you're not, just say so, but there's essentially quite a lot of innovation in what you do in terms of finding ways to get information that starts with a whistleblower to the media that doesn't violate those laws and stays in it. Um, that's got to be quite interesting work for your lawyers, right? Yeah, that's the biggest challenge. The biggest challenge is to make sure that every link of that communication chain is protected legally. And you've worked with us on some of our cases, so you know how tricky that can be. But, you know, essentially... You this, this was what I was avoiding saying what it was. <laughs> no, it's fine, because, you know, there are rights that different groups have. For example, um, in some cases, we will make a disclosure to an agency, and then our client will ask us to make a disclosure to a member of Congress. 
um, and that's certainly within their rights. And then Congress has the legal authority to do whatever they deem necessary to, you know, for the public interest. So it's all protected if it goes through a certain path. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting in that it's a little bit like the sort of difference between public key encryption and uh, sort of old school security by obscurity. People often don't realize that while there are good legal protections for journalism in most democracies, they're not perfect, I, I've fallen foul of them, um, but the protection is for us, it's not for our sources. And so our promise to sources is we'll do everything to keep exactly. your identity secret so it's not discovered. Your model is quite different. It's not they can't learn that you gave it to act to the lawyer who gave it to the committee who gave it to the journalist. Um, that all can be known. It's, it's actually quite a shift, isn't it? It's hiding in plain sight. Yeah, um, well, the vast majority of our cases are anonymous. Yeah. Um, because if you're a whistleblower and you still work in the place that you're blowing the whistle on, then you have to be anonymous. Um, but there have been some pretty high profile cases of ours and every decision on whether the identity is revealed is you know, a very conscious decision. And are you a law firm yourself or are you something that works with law firms? You know, how, how does that work? You know, it's, are these people your client in the legal sense? They are. They retain whistleblower aid for their legal representation. Um, we pick up the tab, obviously, and we create legal teams of lawyers co-counsel in various jurisdictions on various subject matters so that our clients can have complete coverage and support. And presumably the whistleblowers can't pay you for that. So no, they never how, pay us. how are you financed? So we are financed through donations and grants from philanthropies and people that, you know, understand and support our theory of change. Yeah. Um, just, so you said most of your um, sort of clients are anonymous. A couple of them are very conspicuously not. Do you want to sort of let, let the room know about the, the high profile ones? Because they'll certainly have heard of them, even if they've not necessarily heard of you. The roof's leaking, that's ominous. <laughs> so, always good to talk about sources and journalism and have a leak, isn't it? <laughs> it's apropos. <laughs> So, um, yeah, every time we make a decision for an identity be to be revealed, it's conscious. So, for example, last year, our client, uh, Frances Haugen, was here on center stage. She is the Facebook whistleblower. Um, she came out with tens of thousands of pieces of documentary evidence. And because of the way Facebook has a very insular um, vocabulary, it's difficult for a lay person to look at those documents and understand what they're seeing. So Frances very, felt very strongly that you know, she wanted to help people understand what they were looking at um, because obviously her intent is for you know, public and policy makers to force the corporation to make decisions that are in the public interest rather than for profit. Um, and of course, you've helped someone else more recently, so haven't you? This year, uh, we represented Mudge, who is the uh, Twitter whistleblower. Um, Mudge was the top person at the corporation in charge of security, so like top four, five, six people at Twitter. And um, he is a lifelong cybersecurity expert. He has spent his entire career trying to make um, technology and internet safe for users and the world. So uh, his lifetime achievement and the gravitas of who he is and his expertise was very important for his disclosure. So for her disclosure, it was very much dependent on documentary evidence. For his disclosure, it was very much based on his expertise and his knowledge. Some people sort of often misunderstand with document leaks. They sort of almost think you have a pile of documents and that's an easy story. And, you know, for example, so with, with the Snowden <laughs> stuff, it was like reading an operating manual in a foreign language because you didn't just have the technical talk, which 
you know, we had some specialist reporters who were quite good at that, but all of the program code names that they exactly. all reference. And what, you, what we found with that was we couldn't go to any experts. Uh, you know, you couldn't go to retired people even if they were sympathetic, because they essentially said, if I read that, I'll lose, at a minimum, I'll lose my security clearance exactly. forever. And so, you, especially when things start touching classified, you hit a whole new level of complication, don't you? Have, have you had to deal with that for something where you intended, or the client intended it, to reach the public yet? Um, so, we have had cases where there's a top secret element or something that is very Im important to be kept uh, quiet for national security reasons. And then a public portion, which you know could be informative to you know the general public and public discourse. So, um, you personally have had quite an interesting career, haven't you? You haven't just sort of always been in law. If people are thinking of that, you've sort of done media, you've done tech. What's sort of your journey? Does it does it feel like a linear journey for you, or like you've hopped around? Well, everything is related, you know, more and more in the world, everything's related. So I identify as a human rights activist. Um, obviously, you know, at Radio Free Asia, for 16 years, we were bringing news and information into censored environments, authoritarian countries. And if you look at it from this lens, every one of those sources, those stringers, those video journalists, those are all whistleblowers, you know. and the risk and the danger they face in their countries for trying to report out something that is truthful is parallel to what we're seeing with whistleblowers. So the difference now is it's not restricted to 10, 12 countries and not restricted to certain issues, but across the board, everywhere there, where there's an asymmetric relationship that's preventing transparency, whistleblowers can drive so much change with just one person. And so let's, let's go to the missing link between Radio Free Asia and where you are now, which is uh, the Open Technology Fund. Um, I mean, you founded that, didn't you? Um, you know, what, it's about 10 years ago now, is that about right? 11 some years ago. And so and this grew out of that need to try and get accurate information out, try and stop censorship. It, it clearly grew out of working in countries with those systems. Exactly. So. Um, it's just brutal to run an organization like Radio Free Asia because so many people that feed the mission are in danger and they go to prison and they get you know, tortured and killed sometimes. It's terrible. So around you know, before I created the OTF, there was a revolution in Burma called the Saffron Revolution, which Radio Free Asia broke the news and kept running until the junta took the control of the country again. At that time, every single person we talked to was sent to prison using transcripts of the phone calls made to Radio Free Asia journalists. So that's the moment where I was like, look, we gotta do something different here. We have to be able to protect people's digital lives or their real lives are gonna get impacted. So uh, we created the Open Technology Fund, which is also a nonprofit. It receives funds from the US government and finances technology, open source technology that can be used in all of these communities around the world to protect normal people. So the idea at the time was there were super, super great things that were going on like Tails and Tor, etc. But a normal person living, you know, in a village in Burma could never benefit from that. So the Ep Ep Open Technology Fund was meant to create you know, very easy to use technology that could be scaled and translated into 200 languages so that people anywhere who need digital security could get it. There was quite a lot of experimentation, wasn't there? It was, um, I, I find that interesting because I think it joins up. It's different approaches to the same goal. Is it media, is it law, is it tech? But you know, you, you experiment, I think you had a hand in creating Signal indirectly, is that right? But then things like mesh networking and ways of looking at remote internet for places. Uh, there, was, there was some quite sort of out there, you know, there were some bets that were very likely to fail and I'm sure it's many that did. We had there. the luxury of being able to take risks, you know, because 
in my view, the people on the front line are taking enormous risks. And the least we can do is try to make their lives safer. So um, we had the advantage, as you're saying, of being a startup. And we could you know, change things as we went. And you know, some of the most important things that the Open Tech Fund has done are based on things we discovered, like the localization lab. We realized that it was impossible for Tor to pay for Tor to be translated for all the communities that need to use it. So we created you know, something called the localization lab that used crowds crowdsourcing to enable this kind of rapid translation, especially surge. So if something were happening yeah. in the Ukraine, we could do a surge of translations in and that language. And you can tap into people wanting to do something where they don't have more direct skills, which exactly. is Exactly. So is we tried cool. to build a framework and infrastructure that pushed success for the individual you know, developer that had a great idea about how to help people. One, one thing I quite like and feels like a common thread to me is, you know, the Open Technology Fund was mostly or entirely US government funded, wasn't it? Uh, and at the same time, you had the NSA with far more US government funding, almost working in the opposite direction. Sort of similarly, you know, this is trying to use US laws and structures that are often designed to support state power against it. There's, you know, when you yeah, talk about was, power asymmetries, it, it feels a bit judo-ish as an approach. Yeah, it's, it was very, very tricky, and there have been many moments during the OTF's initial years where the FBI or the Justice Department or the NSA, other US government aspects were not thrilled by what we were doing, um, and particularly around encryption. There's a lot of tension there. but. At the end of the day, um, the people on the Hill that understood the importance of information, transparency, and accountability all supported the OTF. And honestly, a lot of law enforcement agencies use the tools that OTF <laughs> created. So, you know, there is a tension, but I think that there is a way to thread the needle. So we are very nearly at the end of our time, but I would be remiss if I didn't, as my final question, ask. If there's anyone in the audience who is seeing something they're not happy with or feeling like they need to blow the whistle and need some support, what should they do? So if you go to our website, whistleblowerain.org, there's a signal number. Um, you can reach us over the Signal app, which is a secure end-to-end -end messaging app. And um, that's how most people reach us. They send us a message on Signal, and then you know we'll contact them. We'll have an intake call to see if we can help. You know, there are people, whistleblowers, that come at different stages, like after they've gone to the press. We're not ideal in that situation because we are created to help you do this all in the safest way possible. So I would say if you see something, your conscience is saying, I don't like doing this, then feel free to reach out to us. And at the very least, we can give you advice about what steps to take. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much for joining thank us. You. And thank you, Libby, for being so fascinating. Thank you so much, James. Thanks, everybody.